Anywho, last video I spent a lot of time upgrading the swag of the game, because swag is objectively good. After I had gotten my swag fix, for the time being, I started working on a map editor, because I realized that the game stinks. And it doesn't just stink, it sucks. And I'm making the game. The goal with the level editor is essentially to alleviate me of all my work and responsibility. That's right. You're going to make my game. You, you, don't click away from this video. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Your ideas are much more better than, much more better than mine. And so they should probably be in the game. Eventually, the goal of the level editor is so that players can upload maps to something like the Steam Workshop, and other players will be able to download them. This way, people can make their own dungeons and layouts and trap rooms and things like that, and then you can pit yourself or your friends against your challenge. You'll be able to toggle them on and off per pack. I'll be honest for just a moment and admit that I too need the level editor. I need to make levels in the game where enemies have specific objects, chests are locked in certain ways, pressure plates trigger certain traps. I can set up a variety of these things if I have a level editor. There are five modes that you'll be able to switch through when editing a level. One is drafting, two is notes, three, wiring, four is markup, five is edges. Drafting is for setting up what objects are where in the room. You can change the width and height of the room and search up objects as you wish and place them in the room. There's also an object spawn type mode that allows you to place general objects that are selected from a list based on the different floor type. That general object will be selected every time that room is generated from a pool of objects. This way you can sort of have variation within a single room type structure. Notes allows you to select a specific object and then edit its parameters. So for example, an emitter object gets a rotation and you can set what it emits. It can emit literally anything in the game, but it will handle them all smoothly. Whether it's a rigid body that needs to be flung, a bullet that needs to be shot, or just a spike that could be placed in front of it. Some other properties include pick up and equip objects. So if you have a skeleton that can pick something up on its back and also equip a weapon, you can do that as well. Now that I'm done uh, pantomiming, pantomiming, what is that? What does it even mean? Miming, pantomime, communication by means of gesture. Oh, that was right. I'm pantomime. You learn something new every day. Three, wiring. Wiring will allow you to connect different trigger objects to objects that will trigger them and vice versa. This way I can set up multiple different types of traps. And there are some objects that have properties when triggered that aren't really shown or said in the game. So you can experiment and find out what they do. For example, here's a freebie. When a explosives is triggered by a pressure plate, it immediately explodes instead of having to wait to be hit. Things like that. Four is for markup. This is just internally important. So basically when you spawn a room, it needs a place to spawn the three most important things in the game, which are the player, the floor key, and the floor ladder to get to the next floor. If you can't spawn those things, the game is a dead end. Every room can specify three of the least important spaces in it for those things to spawn. So if you were going to destroy something in the room, what would you want it to take away so that it doesn't de destroy the integrity of the room uh, conceptually? For example, if you had a trap door that was connected to a pressure plate, you wouldn't want to get rid of either the trap door or the pressure plate. You would want to select something else in the room so that that interaction stays complete and makes sense when the player is playing it. The fifth and final mode is called edges. It just allows you to place these unpassable walls that the player can't get through. When the level generates, it'll always clear a certain amount of these walls when there's a connecting room. But if there's no connecting room, then this will be completely walled off. I don't let the player just put them willy-nilly because I don't want them to make completely impassable rooms. So you can only place them on the, the two closest outer tiles towards the edge. I also, in the process of making this, made it so that you could load and test your debug rooms as well. I might make it so that you can't make a room with things you don't have unlocked. So maybe you have to like see it in the game or collect that swap ability. Or I might just give the player complete freedom. In any case, I think... I want it to be easy to get those things in the map editor because this allows players to really just like explore and toy around with the game, which is really what I want it to become eventually is sort of a sandbox, more of a sandbox kind of thing.
One task that I had along with the map editor was making all the lock types work because I needed the little pictures for the map editor because it looks sick. But the lock types uh, are as follows. There is a, a golden lock, which requires a key. A bone lock, which requires a bone key, which I added as well, which will just be a super rare drop from enemies. A rusted lock, which just needs to be blown up. A price tag, which will be important for the shop so that players can know how much something costs if it spawns in the shop and then you can buy it. And lastly, uh, a curse lock, which will spawn a small challenge. So it'll take the sort of enemy score for the level and then take a portion of it and spawn an amount of enemies based on that, that score to give you an accurate challenge for where you're at in the game. These lock types can be set. And then also some objects just have a natural built-in amount of chance for certain lock types. That's pretty much all I got up to these past two weeks. I think it's coming together pretty well. You can already see sort of the possibilities coming together when I throw just a few things together in a small level. Um, it's pretty funny. I can also use it for debugging, so testing, like what would an enemy sort of prioritize? I can run very controlled tests in this level editor. Eventually, you'll be able to like save and output your rooms. I also want it to look like kid picks because kid picks is swag and swag is good. So I made five little tools that you can select from and they correspond to each of the modes. You can also press one through five on the keyboard to switch between the modes. And I'm gonna update some of the colors so that it's very apparent what mode you're in as well. Thanks for checking out the video. You should wishlist the game on Steam if you're interested and only if you're interested. There's still a ton of potential. So if you like the systems you see or sort of the, the way things are coming together, give it a wish list. And uh, if not, um, I hope you stick around for another video. And if you don't, that's cool too. Thank you for watching. I appreciate you spending your time checking out the videos. And I got a bunch more on the whole development on the game if you're interested in checking those out. Also, I want to start doing this to sort of increase transparency about the process. Um, the wish list of the game Cavern on Steam is currently sitting at 209 wish lists. Uh, a lot of people say you need 10,000 to have a successful Steam launch. I think hopefully I'll sort of like, as I make more videos and make more about the game and have a more presentable project, I can update the Steam page and people will check it out more, as well as doing the next fest demo and also just releasing a demo in general. I think those things will have major impacts on how many people see the game and choose to wishlist it. Um, but obviously I have a very long way to go before I hit that 10,000 mark. And Obviously, I'd like to exceed that. I've never had a game with that many wish lists. When I released Bunny Hill, it had maybe like 300, and a lot of the traffic came from the musician that I worked with. Um, but right now, the game that game sits around like 2,000 to 3,000 wish lists. With all of my Cavern videos totaled up at the current moment, they've accrued 5,633 views on YouTube, and I think like 200 out of 5,000 people who watch videos. Some of those people are returning viewers watching multiple videos, but 200 out of that 5,000 is pretty decent in my experience. In my experience with YouTubers who do development logs, it's not that they don't share these metrics, but getting an insight into the process, like as it's happening, could be very beneficial because it's kind of bleak. Like I've been working on this game for six months and I have 200 wish lists, and you'd say like, what are you doing? That's nothing. There's a lot of work that goes in to games like under the hood that doesn't really get to be shown um i don't have a playable demo yet the game is still very like sort of in in its infancy so um and i think if you want to do something like that you think has uh legs and will go far not that it will necessarily take a long time but you sort of have to put your head down and invest the time if you believe in the in the thing itself and i have no guarantee that this will work out but i figured i'd give myself a chance and you should too you should make games you should try to make a game and you should even try to put it on Steam for money or for free or whatever, just to put it out there. <laughs>